Welcome back out on the Mushroom Trail. It's another just beautiful March day out here. We're headed into the forest to see what we can find in the way of mushrooms. So thanks for coming along. If you're liking these videos, remember to hit that like button, subscribe, stay tuned, and let's jump in. Let's see what we see. So moving just down the trail here, we've got a big old Western red cedar, which is not typically a tree that we associate with mushrooms. But as I approach this tree, I notice a small little bit of color coming off of the side of this. And we've got here something that is super, super fascinating. So notice we have what appears to be just kind of a typical mushroom growing from the mosses here. We've got a smaller one back over here that you can see is in a younger stage. But this is not just any mushroom. This is what's commonly referred to as the lichen agaric. And this is one of the very few lichenized mushrooms that's a basidiomycete. So a lot of the lichens pair with ascomycetes. But this is very, very unique because we've got something that's actually a lichen. So this is a symbiotic relationship with an algae. So we've got the kind of fungal component of this, which we're seeing right here. This is actually working in symbiosis with an algae. If I drew, zoom in on the base here, we may be able to see the algal mat that this is actually growing out of. You may be able to see that green dotted little speckled surface growing on the side of the cedar. This is actually photosynthesizing and collecting energy through the process of photosynthesis in conjunction with the sun. And that's fueling this fruiting of this lichen agaric. So we can see, if we take a look at this cap, notice that we've got striations, we've got a scalloped margin and strongly decurrent gills running down that stipe. So that's an older specimen. You can see that's kind of a lighter beige color. If we pan over to this one over here, we notice this is slightly darker, you know, so it's got a little bit more of an orangish hue to it. That's because as this thing ages, oftentimes it's going to kind of fade in color. We refer to that as being hygrophonous. So a lot of mushrooms have a uh, hygrophonous cap, and that just simply means that as they dry out or age, they tend to fade in color and change. So this is a prime example of a young one. If I zoom in on the base of this, let's just see if we can see that algal mat. You may be able to get a slight perspective on that. It's kind of hard to see because again, all of this stuff is happening at the micro scale but really a stunning one to look at. And, you know, lichens are super fascinating. Um, you know, it's easy to stroll through the forest and to overlook a lot of the mosses and the lichens. But any time that I take an opportunity to stop and pause and just kind of zoom in on this whole little micro world, boy, it sure is fascinating. So, and then just in case you're, you know, not familiar with those terms of ascomycete, versus the citiomycete. So basically, the ascomycetes are gonna produce spores differently than the basidiomycetes. So there are a lot of mushrooms, including morels, that are ascomycetes. So they produce their, score, their spores in little packets or sacs, whereas the basidiomycetes, most of the typical mushrooms that you would associate or think of as mushrooms are very often Basidiomycetes. So this is a lot of guild mushrooms and the things that we would typically identify as such, or that you know, just a typical person walking through the woods would identify a mushroom. It's probably going to be a basidiomycete. So again, lichen agaric, super awesome to see out here. Very common up here, even common up in the Arctic. So kind of interesting, and again, one of the only lichenized garrick so really a cool site out here if you haven't stopped to marvel at this one take a look on your next hike out here in the pacific northwest see if you can locate this one there's a pretty good chance that you're going to see it 
out and about really any time of year, but especially right now. It's cool to see. So moving just up the trail here, we've got a very welcome sight growing off of this big leaf maple branch, along with the licorice ferns. We have a lone mushroom here that some of you may recognize from videos past. So this is what's known as the wild anoki. It also sometimes goes by the name the velvet foot or the velvet shank. And as I pan underneath, you can see why that gets its or how it gets its name. As this one ages, it tends to develop a dark kind of velvety furry uh, structure over the stipe or the stem there. Furthermore, as I pan even lower, you'll notice a white gill structure. So really pretty mushroom here. And this one, as referenced in the past, is not only edible, but also medicinal. So really beautiful mushroom, fun to see out here. You can see that that cap has a little bit of shine or sheen to it. When this one is young, it'll be very viscid or kind of sticky and it'll look moist to the touch. Uh, it's, you'll notice it's got that caramel color. And uh, if you look in the top, you can see this one has probably been nibbled on by some bugs or slugs of the like. But really cool to see. I would actually expect to see a few more out here growing with this, but it seems like this one's all by itself, along with these licorice ferns, just kind of holding down the fort. So I'm gonna keep my eyes peeled. And this is definitely a cool one to see because this, you know, will encourage me to check back in this particular spot to see if I can find more fruitings of the wild anoki, one of my favorite mushrooms to find out here. And sure enough, as I started to look a little more closely, look at what I discovered, a nice young fruit body. I'm just gonna clear that stick out of the way. But boy, you can really see the way this wild anoki just shines and glistens when it's young. Such a beautiful mushroom, one of my absolute favorites to find out here. So really cool to see. Again, you can see that this one is also getting that darkening or that black velvet down near the lower base of the stipe. But boy, just a prime example of that caramel looking cap. It just looks somewhat magical. So um, in case you missed in past videos, so even though this one is edible and medicinal, it's certainly not a beginner's mushroom and it's not one that you just want to rush out to the woods and seek out to harvest without having really good clarity around what the field marks are for this one. So this could potentially be confused with the deadly gallerina, which is a mushroom that's not just poisonous, but actually deadly poisonous. So um, the key field mark or what you're looking for on this is, you know, white spore print. So when you look underneath this, you can tell that the, it's got a white um, gill structure and that's somewhat indicative of the spores, but you really want to do a true spore print to see. Sometimes if you've got these layered, they'll uh, leave a spore deposit on the caps of neighboring mushrooms, which can be beneficial. Th that's obviously not the case here. This is just being a lone enoki. Um, but that's something that's absolutely key. You also want to look to see if there's any kind of like little ring or annulus around the cap. So the one that's deadly poisonous will oftentimes have a little ring or annulus or collar around that stipe. So that's another thing. You can see this one does not have that because this is not the deadly gallerina, but in fact, the wild enoki. So very cool to see out here. One of those ones that's not afraid of the cold weather. These actually have a chemical component that mimics or works as like an antifreeze component. So these will continue to thrive during the winter when other mushrooms are not doing so well. So very cool to see out here. And uh, one of those ones that boy, anytime I see it, just even giving pause and really admiring, it never gets old. So one of my absolute favorite mushrooms, keep your eyes peeled. So take a look just over here off the side of the trail. We've got a branch with a very small white mushroom. I'm actually going to take this stick and I'm just going to slowly roll this over. Let's see what we see underneath. Look at that. Boy, just beautiful. And let me just clear out 
little sword fern there. Oh, wow. And looking down this, boy, we see lots of examples. So I'm just gonna zoom in here to give you a look at what this gill structure looks underneath. So this is likely a mushroom that's commonly referred to as an oysterling. There are lots of different specific species here, so tough to kind of key in on exactly which one, but this is likely in the Crepidotus genus. Sometimes these are referred to as oysterlings, other times they're referred to as creps. But very common growing off of kind of sticks and branches and boy, what a beautiful gill pattern. And you can see that these are just bright white, virtually no stipe or stem, right? So it's flush with the stick. You can see more mature one here that's a little bigger and easier to spot from above. Whereas these ones that are much smaller are growing completely underneath. And boy, this one in particular, if I zoom in, you can see that tomentose margin or kind of like hairy little edge to the cap. Very cool to see and fun to admire. So moving just up the trail here, just off to the side, growing off of this dug fir, we've got an especially beautiful mushroom fruiting out here. Take a look at that. What a stunner, right? So several of you, I'm sure, recognize this one. This is in the genus Hyphaloma. Now, this one is actually an edible mushroom known as the conifer tuft. But similar to the enoki that we were talking about, this is probably not a beginner mushroom for the simple fact that there's a very common related mushroom known the sulfur tuft, Hyphaloma fasciculari, that looks incredibly similar to this one. So, and boy, if I glance up this log, take a look at this. There's a really nice flash of fruiting that I actually didn't notice at first glance, kind of hiding behind these blackberries here. So take a look at this. Boy, this is a prime example of the way that these ones oftentimes grow. So this also gives us a good view up underneath at those gills of that one. So you can see that it's got kind of a light gray or smoky appearance. This one is sometimes called the smoky gilled hyphaloma for that reason. Also the conifer tuft. Again, this one in particular is Hyphaloma capnoides, a really good edible mushroom that oftentimes grows on conifer wood. But again, not one that's commonly sought out. In fact, a lot of times, people who even have a pretty good idea what this is will oftentimes leave it for the simple fact that, again, that Hyphaloma fasciculari looks very similar to this. And uh, the Hyphaloma fasciculari will actually have almost like a neon yellow green gill color underneath. So, but boy, from the top, these look really, really similar. A lot of times I'll carry a UV flashlight, a 365 nanometer flashlight, and the fasciculari will really fluoresce, but Hyphalomas in general look really nice under UV light. So that's one of those things, if you've got one of those handy and you happen to encounter these, it's a really cool way to observe this one. And you can even use that to somewhat differentiate these from one another. So very cool, excited to see this out here. And uh, definitely a good one to keep your eyes out for, but also to uh, kinda, you know, harvest with caution. You know, I wouldn't recommend this one unless you really feel confident in your identification skills because eating that fasciculari, the Hyphaloma fasciculari or sulfur tuft would not be a very good experience. So for that reason, this one's probably best admired from the side of the trail, but I will say that a lot of folks that are really experienced mycologists oftentimes view this as one of their favorite and choice edibles. So interesting to see Boy, what a beauty. I uh, think that this one is a particularly stunning fruiting. Looking really nice out here. So 
awesome to see. Certainly keep your eyes peeled. And if you do see it, take some time. Just admire. Cool to see. Boy, so earlier we referenced the simple fact that these mosses and lichens that grow on the side of these trees are oftentimes overlooked, but boy, they can be fun to admire and they can really put on a show. If we direct our attention over here, I'm gonna zoom in. Look at this, just beautiful. This is what's commonly referred to as the lipstick powder horn. And if you look at this, boy, you can sure see where it gets its common name. So we've got that red tip coming off of this just beautiful lichen, certainly dressed up today and really putting on a show for all of us. Beautiful to look at and you can see it just kind of growing in abundance out here along with the broom moss. Again, this is the lipstick powder horn. Beautiful to look at. So keep your eyes peeled for these because boy, they're easy to overlook or to not really take time to appreciate. But anytime I stop and really admire this, I'm always glad I did. Cool to see. So I'm just in the forest and boy, these coyotes are going nuts out here. Listen to this. They've been actually calling back and forth. There's one group, large group, that I'm walking towards. There's another group behind me, or maybe it's an individual behind me. Never know what you're gonna find out here. This is midday, this is about noon, actually early afternoon. Kinda crazy. Let's see if we can spot them. Getting closer. They're definitely going on and on about something. Let's see if we can track them down here.
and just moving up the trail here, see a small white mushroom that we featured in recent videos. It's a really cool one that's, that's really out right now here in the Pacific Northwest. So notice we've got a slightly striated cap, slight depression in the middle of this one. If I give it a little bit of a tug and we look underneath, we see that we've got slightly decurrent gills. So not in an extreme sense, but we can see them slightly running down the stipe there. This is a really beautiful mushroom that in the past, in the recent past, you know, really just a matter of weeks ago, I would without hesitation describe this as the fragrant funnel, Clytosity fragrance. Um, you know, closer examination and look into recent research, specifically uh, DNA sequencing, has, you know, called some of that into question. So I've noticed that a lot of the recent sequencing has had these coming back as Clytosity deceptiva. So, you know, there's a little bit of uncertainty in terms of which species is the most frequently occurring or most present out here in the Pacific Northwest. There's also a little bit of discrepancy over what the source, the original Clytosophy fragrance was, you know, located overseas quite a bit ago. So there's some confusion over what the proper name is. You may hear this recalled or referred to as the fragrant funnel, um, Clytosophy fragrance or Clytosophy deceptiva, both of them have a really strong anise scent. So if I give this a whiff, really pleasant kind of black licorice anise scent. So super cool one to see, easy to pin down to Clytosophy, but maybe perhaps a bit more difficult to pin down to species at this point. So let me know if you've got an opinion on that, but cool to see just down the trail from this Clytosophy that we're looking at, the fragrant funnel. We've got another really interesting site. Wasn't really expecting to see this, but this is not an uncommon site out here. This is what we refer to as the American shrew mole. I tend to see these quite frequently, laying lifeless just like this. And I'm not 100% sure what the cause always is. If this is, you know, getting preyed upon and then left behind, so hunting more for sport by other animals, or if this is like falling to the elements or what the, actual cause of death may be, but this is not an infrequent occurrence out here. So kind of crazy to see, just figured I'd throw that up there real quick. Hopefully it doesn't gross anyone out, but interesting to see. Moving just down the trail here, see a little bit of white color coming off this branch here. Let's investigate. Let's see what we see here. So you can see that this branch fell down from the top of the canopy and we see wrapped up in this all these different lichens and this particular mushroom. Some of you might recognize this from the underside. We saw, see small white pores. If we flip this over, it's our old friend, the turkey tail, Trimedes versicolor. So very cool. It's been especially windy recently and so whenever we get this opportunity to kind of investigate these branches and limbs and the tops of trees, it's so cool to see what's going on up in the top of the canopy. So this is, I believe, a red alder branch. So if we kind of zoom out real quick and we look right here, we see where this branch likely kind of came from. Alders will have this tendency to kind of prune the lower branches and it'll only really branch up near the top of the canopy on the older, older trees. So kind of cool to think that this turkey tail was fruiting way up at the top. And as referenced before, you all know by now, Trimedes versicolor, most studied medicinal mushroom on the planet all kinds of benefits from this. So I know a lot of you are looking for this one. Well, I love the idea of this harvesting up in the sky, so high up in the canopy. Very, very cool. We also see plenty more mosses and lichens. We see a little bit of usnea there, the beard lichen. So cool, so much to learn about what's going on 
and canopies of these trees. So just figured I'd pull over really quickly, highlight that. Cool to see turkey tail falling from the heavens. I'm just coming up the trail here, see a little splash of orange color coming off of this coniferous log here. We zoom in and take a quick look. This is one of the witch's butters. This particular one, Dacromyces chrysospermus. Again, these witch's butters, there's a few different species, all of which are kind of in this unique class of being edible raw when they're fresh and young. So just looking at this one, boy, you can kind of see this is anything but fresh and young, so wouldn't even consider nibbling on this, but kind of a cool one to see, very common out here. I'm sure several of you here in the Pacific Northwest have been looking at this all winter long. It's kind of on a tail end of its season, but always fun to see. Definitely adds a nice splash of color out here to the forest floor. We'll see. So check this out. Just coming down the trail here, something caught my eye off to the side so look under this salal bush look at this leaf how cool that is peel that back just so you can take a look just amazing definitely some fungal action taking place there. You can see that just getting over, that leaf getting overrun by mycelium. So cool to see. Just had to stop to kind of pull over just to admire that. So super cool to see. You never know what you're going to find underneath these salal bushes and amongst the forest litter and duff. So keep your eyes peeled. Just up the trail here, we've got yet another Clytosabe. This one I figured I'd pause to take a look at because of the simple fact that it's a little further along. It's a little larger. So here you can see how it kind of forms that funnel-like shape, right? That's where this one tends to get its name, the fragrant funnel. And I can smell this just standing here, that smell of anise or black licorice. So. Again, I'm commonly, you know, using the common name Fragrant Funnel, but as referenced earlier, the exact species name, a lot of the DNA sequencing is coming back as Clytosabe deceptiva instead of Clytosabe fragrans, but I would easily still refer to this by that same common name, Fragrant Funnel. So cool to see, cool to smell. So it's been super windy out here, and anytime we get windstorms coming through the forest, boy, it's an interesting opportunity to investigate some of these lichens that blow down from higher up in the canopy. So we can see on this little twig, this is one of those lichens that I don't see all that often. This is what's commonly referred to as Imshog's tube lichen. And boy, just look at that vibrant green color. Almost looks otherworldly, right? Like it's something that you would find at the bottom of the ocean or something. Just such a cool growth structure there. And um, again, this is one that I don't see as frequently as some of the others. So if we look down this, you know, we see some ruffle lichens and some old man's beard or usnea down there at the end. But this Imshog's tube lichen is really quite a sight. So cool to see out here. If you happen to be in the forest after a high wind event, don't forget to admire these, these lichens that are uh, dropping down from the canopy. Such a joy to see. In case you aren't familiar with oak moss, this is a really common lichen that I oftentimes see after these windstorms. And boy, just look at the features on that. So it's a little lighter in color. It's got that really unique growth form. 
so cool to see and again just dropping down from higher up in the canopy it's amazing to think how nicely these uh, lichens play with one another we see back here we've got more usnia or the old man's beard we've got a shield lichen right here as well so all of these representing a very strong fungal component so again symbiotic relationship between fungi and algae so very cool that these fungal partners have teamed up with algae to kind of capitalize on photosynthesis and uh, get some fuel that way so cool thing to observe and uh, always a pleasure so if you find yourself out here in the woods after a wind storm or a wind event don't forget to stop to admire the lichens just up here on the side of the trail growing off of this alder We've got some uh, oyster mushrooms poking out. So these are, of course, true oysters in the Pleurotus genus. If we take a quick look, let's just peek underneath. So you see nice, the current gills running down the stipe. And you can catch a little bit of a scent of anise, kind of a fungally anise smell coming off these oysters. These guys are pretty small, so I'm gonna let them be. I'm gonna let them do their thing, but cool to see, sure sign of spring out here that the oysters are starting to go. And just up here on the side of the trail, little mushroom sight catching my eye. This is one that we featured in videos past. Ooh boy, we've got some really interesting growth structures here though. So this is what's commonly referred to as the sticky oysterling, Skytenotus longincus. You can see it's got kind of a bit of a rosy kind of pink appearance in this young state. So sometimes it's referred to as the rosy oysterling. Boy, this is kind of unique though. Look at these long stipes or stems here on this one kind of moving over to the side. That's quite unusual. I don't typically see that. Usually I see a relatively stubby or short stipe. It's more like what we see down here. So very curious. I don't know exactly what would lead to that particular growth on these few sp specimens over here, but cool to see. So again, the sticky oyster like this guy noticed long and coos. Edibility unknown, but a lot of bold, daring mycologists have are taken and trying these and report liking them. I personally have not, but cool one to see out here. And really quickly, just so that we're solid on our identification here, so you can see like very slight striations, generally a pretty stubby little cap. They'll oftentimes be sticky on the top when it's young. If I lay this up here in the light, you can see what that gill structure looks like underneath. So it sort of resembles an oyster, and you can sometimes see how this could be confused, right? It's growing on also red alder, so similar substrate. That tends to be where I see this one, is actually on debarked red alder. And you can see if we look further up this log, you can see more coming out there from underneath is there so very cool sight cool to see really pretty to look at again a lot of bold or daring mycologists have actually reported sampling or trying this one I personally have not but those who have tried it have reported a good fungal flavor but again officially edibility unknown so interesting to see so just up here on the side of the trail this is not the first American true mole that I've spotted today so Kind of crazy. I tend to bump into these fairly frequently. And I bet a lot of you who are out mushroom hunting will see these. So especially, you know, if you're here in the Pacific Northwest, I think it's somewhat of a localized thing. But this is our smallest kind of mole species. So you can see that those front uh, hands are specially developed for digging and these are actually blind creatures that primarily feed on earthworms so they're oftentimes digging tunnels and you know they're all over in the kind of forest floor doing their thing but also a lot of times they're above ground and they have especially high metabolism so 
I've heard that they have to eat, I, I believe close to one and a half times their weight, they'll oftentimes eat within like 12 hours or something. So kind of crazy. And when they can't get enough fuel, that forces them to come above ground and to look for, you know, other invertebrates aside from earthworms, which, you know, not only exposes them to the elements and to uh, birds of prey and things like that, but it also, you know, can be problematic because they can actually starve. So I think that a lot of times it's a mystery. You know, there are certain animals like certain dogs and cats that will sort of hunt these for sport. So they'll kill them and then leave them. They won't consume them. So sometimes that's certainly the case, but I think a lot of times too, they just run out of food or succumb to the elements, but not an uncommon sight out here in the Pacific Northwest. So if you are out and about, keep your eyes peeled. This American shrew mole, kind of an interesting little creature that you're likely to encounter, unfortunately not in its living state. Although I do see them sometimes alive, bumping around out here blindly, uh, kind of scurrying across the forest floor. So I think they are easy prey for owls and other things, but interesting to see. So coming just up here, I notice a mushroom just off the trail. It's a little past its prime, so we can see it's faded pretty substantially. So I actually happened to notice this one just a couple days ago, and it was more of a kind of like a brown orange color. But this has what's referred to as a hygrophonous cap. So it kind of fades or kind of lessens with age. If we look at this stipe, we can see that still bears the true color. And boy, just looking underneath there, we've got nice widely spaced gills. I believe that what we're looking at here is commonly referred to as the deceiver, Lacaria lacata. This is actually an edible mushroom reported as such. It's not one that I've tried, not one that I hear rave reviews of, so it's not really on my list, but interesting one to see. Cool to be able to recognize it even in this kind of depleted older state. So again, that's the deceiver, Lacaria Lacata. So just off the trail up here, look at this, catching the light just right. You've got a beautiful example of a cup fungi and now this one i've been tripping over these the last several weeks and a few weeks back someone in the comments threw in a third genus to consider on these so these black cup fungi that are fruiting right now pretty difficult to pin down without pulling out a microscope so you know originally i was considering plectania or pseudoplectania and then a new one that got thrown into the mix is Ernula. So could be any of those three. Really what I need to do, I did dust off the microscope, but I realized that I'm short on slides and cover slips. So I need to get that in order. And once I do, I think I'm gonna sample some of these and see if I can start to pin those down. It's very difficult though, when you're out in the field to kind of pinpoint this as being one or the other. But boy, I always love seeing these out here and they've certainly been out in abundance this uh, tail end of winter and beginning of spring. So seeing a lot of these and really enjoying seeing them. If you're here in the Pacific Northwest, keep your eyes peeled, they're easy to miss. But once you get that search image kind of going in your mind, you're very likely to come across these. So cool to see. So just a quick update. If you've watched, you know, several weeks back I encountered my first oysters of the season and they were on this log. I've since har harvested this log a couple times and boy, it just keeps fruiting out. One of the things that I just wanted to show really quickly. So this is a Pleurotus, a true oyster. And um, when we look at this, so in its initial kind of younger stages, this was snow white, right? And now you can see it kind of getting an almost like salmon or pinkish light brownish color cap so very cool to see these are beautiful flush of oysters and still looking really good and out here too and again I've harvested both of these areas more than once you can see they're still still doing well so um, 
debating whether or not to kind of take more home here today or to check back in a little bit. This little little flush right here looks pretty good, but I think I may actually leave them for now and pop back out or just kind of check up on them as time passes by. So very cool to see, keep your eyes peeled. Very high in protein, very nutritious. They tend to be a little buggy, but I'm finding that these early ones, at least for me, are relatively bug free. I've heard in the comments from some folks that unfortunately they're already finding bug and slug infested oysters. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that these stay relatively bug free for now. But uh, anyways, keep your eyes peeled out there. Always fun to come across the oysters. Well, that concludes another fantastic day out here on the Mushroom Trail. Thank you all so much for coming along. And until next time, happy trails.